Did you know that you can use pine cones to make a delicious syrup? Well, not these dried out brown pine cones. But these unripe green pine cones. You see, before a pine cone reaches maturity where it turns all brown and the seeds are ready to go, there are these green sappy things and you can use them to make a delicious syrup. Let's give it a try. Harvesting is really simple. Just pick some unripe cones from your nearest conifer. They can be really sticky though, so I recommend using gloves if you can, like I am right here for these Austrian pine cones. Just don't, don't be tempted by these classic fully mature cones though. I, I promise they have very little flavor to them. Once you've harvested a handful or two of cones, it's syrup making time. Now I know from personal experience, a lot of times these things can feel really intimidating or difficult, but uh, I promise you this is one of the easiest recipes uh, it's so much fun. You're gonna to want to try this at home. All you need is a kitchen scale, a mason jar, some fresh immature conifer cones. Again, these can be from a pine tree like these are. They can also be from a spruce tree, a fir tree. You can do this with juniper berries. Each of them are gonna bring a slightly different flavor to the table, so it's fun to experiment. And finally, sugar. You can really use any type of sugar. I've personally found that turbinado sugar works really well. It seems to bring a much richer, fuller flavor out of the cone. Then all you do is simply add equal parts, cone and sugar. We'll drop in a couple cones. Now, your cone size is gonna vary widely depending on the type of tree, how early or late you harvest them. If you find your cones aren't fitting very well, you can break them in half. Uh, these ones are a little too hard. I personally like to go cone, sugar, cone, sugar, kind of alternate like that, but you can definitely just throw all the cones in there, throw all the sugar in there. That works too. I just find it, it works a little bit better if you're alternating. I've got 104 grams of cones there, and I'm now gonna add 104 grams of sugar. And Keep going. Cones, sugar, cones, and just as many as you can fit in there. I think this is, yep, that should be our last one. One final pour of sugar. Again, just equal parts sugar to cone. One to one ratio as we call that in the ratio business. And that's it, we're done. All we have left to do now is grab the lid, screw it on. And I like to write the species of the tree and the date on there. So this was an Austrian pine, August 17th, 23. And now I'm just gonna mix it all together. Now we just wait and watch and pretty soon, within the first day or two, you're gonna start to see the sugar start to dissolve. See, there's a lot of water and moisture inside these pine cones and the sugar's gonna draw it right out of there. The other thing your cones are gonna have is a coating of wild yeast, which will start to eat and break down the sugars as well. Which does mean, especially in the first week or so, you're gonna wanna burp this regularly. All that entails is simply opening it up, letting those gases escape and resealing. And before too long, you'll go from a jar that looks like this to a jar that looks like this. This is a batch of limber pine cones that I started a while ago, and as you can see, the sugars are fully dissolved. We're left with nothing more than this gorgeous pine cone syrup. Such an interesting smell. It's very, very fruity, not nearly as piney as you would expect at all. So yeah, once you've got nothing left in your jar but pine cones and liquid, uh, you're ready to process your pine cone syrup. You don't need to process it right away if you don't want. You can let it sit and continue to lightly ferment for a few more weeks, a few more months. Basically, the longer you wait, the stronger and more intense the flavor is gonna be. This one has been sitting for a while though, so let's get to processing. This is also really simple. Just dump your jar into a saucepan and bring it up to a healthy simmer. Let that cook for a few minutes, just long enough to thicken it up, but not so long that it turns solid on you. Then just run it through a strainer and into a sanitized jar and that's it. You can store this in your fridge, but I have read that it's shelf stable. Just do whatever makes you feel most comfortable. And you've got yourself a jar of genuine pine cone syrup. Its flavor is fruity and really interesting, and it does vary a bit from one species of conifer to another, so it's really fun to experiment with. Speaking of experimenting, why don't we try that right now by using this batch to make a pine cone flavored cake. But listen, right here, the last time I tried making a cake, I found the frosting stage a, a little frustrating. And I think finding an easier and more efficient way of rotating the cake is gonna go a long way to help us out here. So how about we try and first build a rotating cake platter? 
And since we're making a pine cone flavored cake, why don't we of course use a piece of pine wood, starting by taking this nice big log and milling it down using a chainsaw. Now this piece ended up being a little too big for my tiny little baby band saw, so if it looks like I'm in a different location than the garage you know and love, it's because I am. I'm in my parents garage using their much nicer and larger bandsaw. So hey, thanks mom and dad, we've now got ourselves a nice round piece of pine wood and we're ready to go. It's now time to turn this piece of pine wood into a Lazy Susan, or I don't know, Lazy Susan cake stand icing station frosting station turner arounder thing. You, you, you take your pick. I've got our, so I've got our rotating spinner thing. What I wanna do here is turn a top piece and a smaller bottom piece to go on each end of this, and then they'll be able to rotate like so. I'm also gonna turn a bit of a recess on the bottom piece so that this can hide in there a bit so you're not looking straight on, you're not seeing a bunch of the gadgetry there. Never used one of these before, so this is going to be a bit of an experiment. Screws, I forgot to grab some screws. These ones aren't long enough. This piece of wood came from a pine tree in my grandma's backyard that had to be cut down earlier this year, so this is extra fun for me to be able to give a second life to a piece of a tree that I watched grow from a sapling to a big towering thing. Honestly, to me, this is what makes wood such a unique medium for making or crafting or artwork since it comes from these huge plants that we form personal attachments to. They give us shade and food and something we grew up climbing in and playing under. And yeah, being able to preserve a piece of those trees in something like a bowl or a vase or a spinning rotating cake platter thing, it's just, it's really gratifying. So the specific species of pine this tree was, was an Austrian pine, also called the European black pine, which is a very common landscaping tree. It does really well in urban and suburban areas. It tolerates salt really well. So a lot of cities and places where they salt the roads in the wintertime really favor this tree. And Austrian pine cones are also the ones that I used at the start of this video to show you how to make pine cone syrup since these trees are just so plentiful around here. But really you can use the cones from any pine tree to make syrup. Although the pine needles of the ponderosa pine are mildly toxic and can cause miscarriages. I haven't found any solid info either way on ponderosa pine cones, but to be safe, I'd say avoid them if you're looking to make pine cone syrup. You can also totally use spruce cones, fir cones, Douglas fir cones, etc. The, the conifer you will definitely want to avoid is the yew tree, but its cones are these bright red berries, so it should be easy to avoid them. All right, so right here I'm marking the center of the piece and doing my best to draw two lines at a 90 degree angle to try to outline the rotating insert so that I can make sure I'm carving the recess to the right size. I do mark it a little on the larger size just to be safe and probably went a little too safe, which honestly really isn't that big of a problem. Just needs only to carve this smaller mortise so that it can fit onto the jaws of my chuck. Ooh, I'll show you that here in a second. Momentarily, I'll be able to throw this on. This will hold it in place. We can very simply finish the bottom. For now, let's set this aside. Now, this is going to be the bottom of the top piece. Basically, you're gonna do the same thing here. Make another very small recess to put this in, flip it around, and make the top, and that little recess is just gonna hide. We're, not, we're never gonna see it because those two pieces are gonna to be together. So, let's do that. Okay, this is gonna fit. So hopefully this is coming a little bit more clear now. Uh, basically, we'll have this screwed in there, place it on there, and oh yeah. 
Lovely. Let's start by finishing off the top. go. Okay. Here the objective is to just carve the top of the top piece down to where the screw holes disappear and then just make sure that it's as flat and even as possible. Also get a nice clean straight line on the sides. Okay, top is done. Where did I put the thing? Ah, there it is. Like, I know pine is the plainest and most boring of all woods, but I don't know. I'm very excited to, to throw a finish on this. Just the simplistic beauty of it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Okay, now we've got our bottom piece. Plan here is to, again, just flatten the bottom of this and make it a little bit thinner too. Uh, Now it's time for the part that I've been the most stressed about, and that is installing our rotating insert, uh, which starts by trying to make sure that it's perfectly centered on both the top and bottom piece. The method I used was I had a small center point that I'd marked on each piece while they were still on the lathe, and then using a compass, I made a small sample mark using the screw hole once I thought I had the, the insert properly aligned. I then completed that line to a full circle, placed the insert back on, on there and confirmed that the circle met our four 90 degree angle lines at the spot of the screw holes. I don't know, there's probably a better or more precise way to do this, but hey, this is what you get from a guy like me. Now these star markings right here on the bottom piece are gonna be access holes. This will make more sense in a minute, but I, I'm gonna need those to be able to screw the plate into the bottom of the top piece. Gonna drill some quick pilot holes that'll also help me as markers after I sand off all the pencil lines. Now right here I'm drilling those aforementioned access holes. Uh, you really only need one, but I'm doing two of them just for symmetricality's sake. And before we assemble, I'm gonna add a food safe oil finish going with Walrus Oil's cutting board oil here. Here. And yeah, I think I was right. This is really pretty wood. I mean, the grain is simple, but I, I like it. It just has like a simplistic, clean beauty to it. I love the warm color and tone. It's not a showstopper by any means, but listen, not every piece of wood needs to be. And I really like this for what it is. And even though there's no figure in there, I'm still definitely seeing enough shimmery goodness to give you all a little baby pine cake plate shitoy and see. Okay, so we have our top piece, our bottom piece, our Lazy Susan majig, and screws and a screwdriver. First things first, we're going to screw the plate onto the bottom. I have double checked to make sure that these screws are not so long that they're gonna come poking through the other end. That's one thing to be wary of. Screwing these in. Now, we should theoretically be able to place these, line this one up.
It worked. Look at that. All that's left to do now is head back on up to Kitchen Justin and see if our cake is ready to go. Thanks, garage slash wood area, Justin. And welcome everyone to the kitchen where we've got the makings of a cake. On this half, we have our dry ingredients. On this half, our wet ingredients. So all we have to do now is combine all this and put it in a hot box or an oven and it should produce a cake, fingers crossed. As we've already discussed and shown at length, one of the wet ingredients is some of our pine cone syrup. And I genuinely don't know how this is gonna work out in a cake. My goal is to see how much of this flavor I can get to come through without fully overwhelming the experience. Note, I am not a professional baker and I barely qualify as an amateur one. So what I would say if you wanna make this at home is find a cake recipe that you enjoy and maybe just drizzle some of this on afterward or throw it in the mix. I'm just kind of winging this because I've never winged a cake recipe before. And what better time than live on camera? Okay, I'm gonna bring you all closer and switch over to, to, to voiceover stuff because it's just easier. Okay. All right, so this recipe is gonna be good for two seven inch springform pans and uh, bonus points for the number of wood pieces you can identify from previous videos, by the way. Starting with the dry ingredients, we've got 170 grams of all-purpose flour, to which I'm adding one and one-fourth teaspoons baking powder, one-third teaspoon baking soda, a heaping half teaspoon of salt, and just for fun, some cardamom and a little fresh grated nutmeg. Mix those all together and set aside because now we're gonna go over to the wet ingredients. To a mixing bowl, combine 160 grams of soft room temperature butter, 150 grams of brown sugar, and beat for around three minutes, stopping occasionally to scrape down the sides and continuing to beat until it's looking nice and fluffy. Now it's egg time, so an excuse to go outside and say a quick hello to the ladies. I'm gonna go with three eggs and two yolks here, adding it and mixing it for about a minute or two, again, scraping down those sides when necessary. Uh, it's gonna look real bad at this step, by the way, but let's just trust the process. Now, let's add those dry ingredients, mixing them together with everything until it's fully incorporated and looking a lot better, if not a bit too thick. So let's add 120 milliliters of milk and that glorious pine cone syrup. And I'm just gonna go by vibes here, pouring and mixing until it feels right. Then just beat on high until it's all mixed together. I've pre-weighed my mixing bowl so that I can do some math and figure out how much batter is in there and then do some more math, dividing that by two and sadan, we've got two oiled springform pans full of batter and ready to bake, which they'll do in a 350 degree oven for about 30 minutes or until beautifully golden brown and a poker comes out nice and clean. Gonna flatten off the tops of these since we will be stacking them on top of one another and also before they fully cool off, I'm going to brush on just a little bit more pine cone syrup because, hey, let's get as much of that flavor in there as we can. Speaking of which, while the cakes cool off completely, let's make some pine cone buttercream frosting. Do this thing right. With one cup of softened butter, beat for one to two minutes until light and fluffy. Then add that beautiful pine cone juice. Again, just gonna go by vibes here. Also gonna toss in a half teaspoon of salt. You can skip this if you're using salted butter, but also don't use salted butter. Salt your own butter, it's, it's classier. Beat that for another minute or so, and then it's time to slowly add three cups of powdered sugar, pausing to scrape down the sides, of course, as necessary. And once you've added all of the powdered sugar, let's let that beat until fully incorporated. Then lower the speed and pour in one fourth a cup of heavy cream. Increase the speed and beat until light and fluffy. And now it's time to bring together all of the stars of the episode, the pine wood cake platter, the pine cone frosting, and finally, the pine cone cake itself. This one's got some rough spots to it. Nothing a little buttercream can't fix. Hey bud, you interested in this, huh? Nice, healthy middle layer. Honestly, I kind of thought this might be mostly a joke. but it's working so good. Also, this is so good. Wow, 
That pine cone buttercream, who knew? Now, place layer two. And nice big dollops on top. All right, honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing here. So any pros watching, I'm very, very sorry. But hey, let's be let's be real. This cake stand is so much fun to use. I am positively giddy right now. And now that it's all frosted and cleaned up, I'm gonna to toss it in the fridge to set up a tiny bit. And of course, I'm gonna add some flourishes and here we have it, a pine cone flavored cake with pine cone flavored frosting on a pine wood platter. All right, I am very happy with how this looks. Although I have to admit, these are obviously spruce cones. These are obviously spruce needles. None of the pine cones I have around my house we're small enough to fit on the platter. And I only have a spruce tree in my front yard and I didn't feel like driving all the way up in the mountains to find some pine needles. So let's just pretend. In either case, we're gonna set these aside and let's give this thing a taste. All right, let's give this a try. That's a good cake. Okay, in both the cake itself and in the buttercream, it is very subtle, but it's unmistakably there. You know, a lot of people, when I talk about pine cone syrup, their first thought is pine sol or something really solvent or resinous. And I can tell you right now, this is not the flavor or smell of pine cone syrup at all. Go to the nearest pine tree you can find, pluck a handful of needles and tear them up, break them up, scrunch them together and take a nice deep whiff. You're not gonna get an overwhelming solvent type smell. You're most likely to get a almost citrus-like scent, depending on the species of pine tree. But most of them, the needles, especially when you break them apart, have a fruity citrus-like smell that's mixed in there with the pine smell you know and love. And the unripe green pine cones we used to make the syrup that flavored this whole cake, they have an even stronger citrus or fruit-like smell. But don't worry, there's enough of a botanical tree-like flavor in here that it doesn't taste like you're just eating a citrus or fruit-flavored syrup or cake in this instance. It's its own unique thing, tons of applications. Mm. So if you're new to this, if you wanna try out foraging, eating trees, and it feels really intimidating, trust me, this is a great place to start. Again, it's really easy, it's super fun, and definitely let me know if you try this at home, and especially if you have any fun recipes that you try out on your own, I would really love to hear those. But that's it for this time, and we'll see you here next time when we find more fun ways to eat some trees.